Welcome back to Lipids in Biochemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, we're not going to go over functions of these in this video, but we're going to go over the biosynthesis of some of the important eicosanoids. Okay, what is an eicosanoid? Where does that name come from? Well, you have to think back to your organic. I know. Why would I even want to think about that again, right? Eicos in eicosanoids, eicos was the prefix you would use if you were talking about something that had 20 carbons. So if you had a, an alkane, nothing but carbons and hydrogens, all saturated, and you wanted to name it, you would call it icosane. Icos means 20 carbons. Icosanoids means that most of these molecules are going to either have 20 carbons or, in all cases, they're going to be derived from a molecule that has 20 carbons. And that molecule is called arachidonic acid, a fatty acid. So to start off with, in the membrane of cells, and we're talking about, by the way, the inner leaflet of the membrane, there's a tendency for phospholipids on the two position to have arachidonic acid. For whatever reason, that is the most common place for arachidonic acid to be. And it turns out there's an enzyme called phospholipase A2. What the, what the two means is that it's going to hydrolyze one of these A seals right here, A is for A seal, but it's going to hydrolyze the second one, the one at the two position. Phospholipase A1 would hydrolyze this one up here. So A2 is going to hydrolyze off arachidonic acid. Okay, Arachidonic acid, we've talked about in other videos structurally. It's a polyunsaturated fatty acid, Okay, has four cis double bonds, and we can go into more detail on that in another video. But arachidonic acid is the precursor to all eicosanoids, and there are three classes of eicosanoids. Prostaglandins, number one, number two are thromboxanes, and number three, leukotrienes. Leukotrienes are not indicated in this uh, figure, and we'll cover leukotrienes in another eicosanoid video. Because leukotrienes are synthesized in a little bit of a different way. Okay, They would actually branch off from arachidonic acid directly. But it turns out that thromboxanes and prostaglandins are all synthesized from something down the line from arachidonic acid, not arachidonic acid itself. But let's go into it. You see these two reactions right here. There's a cyclooxygenase reaction and a peroxidase reaction. Technically, these are both cyclooxygenase reactions. Cyclooxygenase itself has two activities. An actual cyclooxygenase activity that gives it its name, and then a peroxidase activity. So arachidonic acid is going to react with cyclooxygenase, and in the first activity, you're going to get something called PGG2. This is just an intermediate. It's a peroxide form of PGH2, which is the active form, and PGH2 is formed from PGG2 by the peroxidase activity of cyclooxygenase. That's not really that important. We just get from arachidonic acid to PGH2, or prostaglandin H2, by cyclooxygenase. And it's from prostaglandin H2 that we get all other prostaglandins and thromboxanes. I'm just going to kind of go into some of these very briefly just to kind of show you how we can transform PGH2. So PGF synthase, that's prostaglandin F synthase. We get prostaglandin F. Prostaglandin D synthase, we get prostaglandin D2. Prostaglandin E synthase, prostaglandin E2. Prostacyclin, by the way, is called PGI2. Prostacyclin actually is, I would consider it one of the more important ones to know, if you're, particularly if you're going to medical school, because prostacyclin, or PGI2, plays a huge role in um, the vasculature. Prostacyclin plays a role in activating and deactivating the platelets okay, during blood vessel injury, things like that. Okay? But that's made by prostacyclin synthase, or PGI2 synthase. Okay? So you can see that a lot of the other prostaglandins are going to come from PGH2. And some of these can actually be processed further by other enzymes. And then we have an enzyme called thromboxane synthase, which is going to convert PGH2 to TXA2 or thromboxane A2. Now, one thing I just want to point your attention to is, even though a lot of these have fairly similar structures, every prostaglandin is going to have a slightly different purpose some of which, like prostacyclin, have a very different purpose, and then thromboxanes are going to have a different function than all the prostaglandins. 
Also, leukotrienes, which are synthesized directly from arachidonic acid by lipoxygenases, they're going to have different functions. So every eicosanoid has a different function. Some of them overlap, but overall their functions are all different. Okay? And, but the point is, is that they all come from prostaglandin H2, at least the thromboxanes and prostaglandins. Okay? And they just react with different enzymes to produce different eicosanoids. Okay? We'll talk about leukotrienes in another video, but one other thing I want to just I want to show you, or at least talk about, is this enzyme right here with the two activities, cyclooxygenase. Cyclooxygenase, as you can see, not directly but indirectly, leads to all other prostaglandins and thromboxanes because I have to have cyclooxygenase in order to get from arachidonic acid to PGH2, and then we know all these others come from PGH2. So let me ask you a question. What would happen if I knocked out the enzyme somehow, maybe inhibited it, if I knocked out cyclooxygenase? What would happen to the production of these five right here, and, and others, basically? What would happen to them? Well, they wouldn't be produced, and why is that? Well, if I knock out cyclooxygenase, am I going to be able to convert arachidonic acid to PGH2? And the answer is no. So if I can't get PGH2, I also can't get anything down the line because these enzymes will have nothing to react with. There's no PGH2. It turns out there's a drug that you probably take all the time, particularly if you're in college and you get headaches and things like that, and it's called aspirin. Aspirin is a drug that actually acetylates irreversibly a critical serine residue in the active site of cyclooxygenase. And what that means is it, co when it, we say attaching an acetyl group, it covalently modifies that serine residue and that completely inactivates the enzyme. That serine is critical. So that's what we call suicide inhibition or irreversible inhibition, okay? Meaning by using aspirin, you actually completely eliminate the activity of cyclooxygenase. So what aspirin is actually doing is it's killing the production of PGH2 and everything else down the line, these five molecules and others. It's killing that activity. But based on what I said, would aspirin inhibit the production of leukotrienes? Well, the answer is no. Leukotriene synthesis comes from arachidonic acid. It doesn't depend on cyclooxygenase. So a kind of question you could see on a test is if you take aspirin, which of the following eicosanoids get shut down? Well, only prostaglandins and thromboxanes get shut down. Leukotrienes don't because they don't depend on PGH2. They depend only on arachidonic acid and not on cyclooxygenase. Okay? And to give you an idea of why aspirin should not be taken in high doses, I'll give you an example that my physiology professor told me when I was in his course a long time ago. When he was working um, in a hospital, um, I don't remember if he was actually a, a medical doctor at the time. He had an MD. He might have been in residency. I don't remember. Someone came into the, um, into the hospital with a problem. They had been riding a motorcycle and got into an accident. They were wearing a helmet, but they were, I guess, hurled off their motorcycle and they hit their head on the concrete. Now, they lived, right? But they were taken to the hospital, right? Some idiot doctor, don't know who it was, but this is a really stupid thing to do, gave him aspirin. Now, they couldn't give it to him orally because they had induced a coma, I think it was, because they were trying to let him recover. So the way you generally give aspirin, I guess back in those days, and you might even do it now, I'm no medical person, but the way you would give aspirin is you give it as a suppository because when you stick something in that cavity, it's absorbed by blood vessels in there. So they gave him a suppository of aspirin. The problem was is they gave him like a five gram suppository of aspirin. What they didn't realize at the time is because of his head injury, he is, his brain had, um, it was injured. It had microscopic uh, tears, which m wouldn't have caused a problem normally, but because aspirin inhibits the production of all these, some of these, particularly prostacyclin, inhibit blood clotting. So he wasn't able to clot his blood with that 5-gram suppository of aspirin, and he bled out and died because somebody was negligent and gave him too much aspirin. They probably shouldn't have given him any at all, to be honest, with the trauma he'd experienced due to his brain. Okay? But that should hopefully give you an understanding of at least the pathway and some ways that we can affect it. All right? In the next video, we're going to go over uh, leukotrienes, and then we're going to do some other things with eicosanoids. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.